So I'll start by introducing you, Luke. Um, okay. Welcome. Welcome to Stolaroid Stories. Um, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on my show. You're the number one podcaster in the world for <laughs> English language learners, at least. You think? Well, yes. I think um, your YouTube channel speaks for itself. Like you've got more than 80, 800,000 subscribers. Did, did you know that? Yeah, it's actually 900,000 because okay. obviously I'm I'm constantly <laughs> refreshing <laughs> the, the page to see uh, the number and it's at 900,000 wow. now. It was yeah, 800 we were... last week, so you got one 100,000 more subscribers this week in yeah. a week. I don't think it was uh, no, it was like 880 something maybe last week <laughs> okay. and it's just it's sort a of lot. like a lot. It's a lot. yeah, yeah, it's doing it's doing well. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. And uh your um your podcast as well, Luke's English Podcast, is the. I, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. It's the number one podcast uh, for English language learners, uh, with more than a million downloads a week. Over a month, a month, a month. Fabio. Oh, it's a, a month. month. Okay. Yeah, you read on my, you read on my, on my LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, you read this on my LinkedIn page, and last time we spoke on my podcast, you said uh, one thousand, one million downloads a week, and I was like, what, really? And you said, yeah, it's written on your LinkedIn. I was like, is it really? And then I checked my LinkedIn. It's, it's one million a month. Okay. So okay. I thought, yeah, good. I haven't been um, giving away false information on LinkedIn. So you have uh, to improve your downloads a week. Yeah. Weekly that's, downloads. That's the aim. Ultimately, Fabio, what I want is just all downloads, all the downloads. You know, you want it all. Okay. <laughs> I want, I want, I want. You know the, you know, nineteen eighty four, the the mm -hmm. George Orwell book. You know, this is yep. what I expect. Hopefully, <laughs> this is the end game. Is ultimately just everyone living in small apartments, and one of the walls of their room is just a big screen with just my face, just talking to them constantly, twenty four hours a day. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. That would be horrible. But, um, we, yeah. Anyway, yes. The the, the it's. I, thank you for saying my podcast is the number one. I don't know if it is. I don't even know how we work this out. But uh, I've I've been going quite a long time. That maybe that's the. I just got a head start on everyone else. Great. You're the podfather, right? <laughs> the podfather. Yeah. Yes. So. Um. But we're not here to talk about um English or learning English or podcasting because to be honest, my listeners, I think they know this now um i'm quite tired of talking about learning english <laughs> i've done more than 80 episodes on how to learn a language i interviewed teachers i wrote a book on how to learn a language uh, there's a blog on how to learn a language on my website and uh now i want to talk about something else about life and um you're a stand-up comedian as i'm sure listeners have already noticed uh, those who don't know you, um, you like joking, you like um, being funny, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is this is what life's all about. Yeah, to an extent, for me anyway. And you perform on stage, so you're a stand-up comedian. You're not a you know you're not as big as Lucy K or Ricky Gervais. No, but you still you still perform on stage, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. How, how did you get into that? How did you get into stand-up comedy? Um, so, let's see. So, I, I was always a huge fan of comedy and mm. stand-up, and that goes back to, like, childhood, just, like, watching stand-up comedians on TV. Mm -hmm. um, and in the UK, stand-up comedy has been a big thing for many years, and um, it's, like, really, really big part of our culture, I think. Yeah. And so on television, we would get not just comedy shows like sitcoms and things, but also we would occasionally see bits of stand-up comedy. For example, there was um, Jack D was a comedian who had a show on Friday or Saturday evening where he hosted, you know, different stand-ups and stuff. And, and uh, you know, there's always been lots of stand-up comedy on TV back, you know, from years and years ago all the way through. Um, and so, you know, watching stand up, I always just loved it, just thought it was amazing. And especially like longer stand up shows where it's like an hour or so and the comedian really gets into a rhythm and it's just it's just brilliant. You know, just really mm. loved those. So I always just loved stand up and loved 
you know, just sort of trying to be funny with my friends and things like that and kind of just coming up with crazy things and making my friends laugh and being made laugh by by my friends. And mm -hmm. um, and then I guess it was also English teaching. So being um, up in front of groups of people. So I was never, I never thought that I could do stand up, right? Um, and I just thought it was impossible f for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but then after a certain number of years of being an English teacher where you have to stand up in front of a group of people. Um, not You're not there to make them laugh, of course. That's an important distinction to make. That's definitely not what you're there for because, you know, that would be a mistake to be the sort of the, the English teacher who oh, the students have come to learn English and you're there, like, you know, using them as an audience. It's terrible and pathetic. So that's not, that's not what the classroom is for. But having spent time and standing up in front of groups of people, you develop a certain level of confidence you eventually learn how to use your voice and you learn how to think and talk on your feet you know mm. and um you get a certain level of ease and comfort in front of people and that having got used to that i think it allowed me to then take the step towards doing stand up and that's that was always more frightening cuz um obviously you don't have the um you don't have the uh the sort of bat the armor of being the English teacher in a classroom. Yeah. That's always the thing that you can fall back on at all times. Is that you know you're, just, you're teaching them, and so you just always focus on the language and listening to the students and stuff like that. In stand up, there's nothing. There's no no defense at all. It's yeah. just you and the audience, and you just have to make them laugh every fifteen seconds or something like that. Yeah. Um, and there's you know so it's um, quite frightening, but. Having built up some confidence of, of public speaking, let's say, I felt like I could uh, give it a shot. And I actually did um, some workshops. So in in the UK, in, in London, there are several kind of courses that you can do um, mm. in stand-up comedy. Oh. Um, and they're, they're basically comedy workshops where you get together with a group of other people who want to do stand-up as well. And uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a, a coach or teacher um, I was with a guy called Logan Murray, who has produced quite a lot of comedians um, in his time. And he's kind of a, a fairly well-known name in stand-up comedy in the UK now. Um, and so we did these workshops where you kind of work on uh, the, 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 the microphone technique, you know, how to stand, how to what to do with the microphone, how to deal with that. And then um, coming up with ideas, coming up with comedy material, testing it out. And the idea of the, it was called the, it was, it was like the absolute beginner's stand-up comedy course, I think is what it was called. And the idea is that at the end of the course, everyone does five minutes in front of an audience and you kind of develop confidence. You, def you understand how to come up with funny things um, and you practice being in front of people trying to make them laugh. It's a supportive, safe environment. And then you do a showcase gig in where everyone invites all their friends and everyone does five minutes. And um, and so I did that and it went, the, the course was, I actually found it very difficult and very awkward. It was like really uh, uh, painful a lot of the time, you know, like mm -hmm. improv. Mm -hmm. If you're doing improvisation, it's just horrible. And you just feel like, oh, God, no one is funny. This is not funny. This is just awkward and uncomfortable. I, oh, God, I hate this. And I, I've, I didn't feel like... What I hoped for was that I'd be with a group of people and we'd be riffing and making funny jokes and it would all be hilarious. And then we'd all go on to become comedy superstars. And then on podcasts, we'd talk about the days when we, you know, met our, our peer group of comedians you know, and, and that we'd talk about it. But it wasn't like that at all. It was just horrible. No one was funny and we were all just really bad. Uh, but it, somewhere in the middle of the course, I, something switched on for me and I started to get a sense of like how to come up with funny ideas. Mm, that's what I, I wanted a, to ask you. Yeah. Mm, mm, how do you mm. come up with, with funny ideas? It's very complicated. It's really, really complicated to, to, to do that. First of all, you need to, uh, hmm, how do you do it? Well, okay, so, hmm, so at the moment, right, I'm I'm based in in Paris and I do stand up in English. I don't do stand up in French because my French isn't. I don't have enough control over my French to be able to do that. 
confidently mm-hmm. yet. Um, so I do it in English, and there's an English language stand-up comedy scene here, and there is in lots of places, like in Berlin and Amsterdam, and lots of places, you know, in, in non-English speaking countries have their little English scenes. So I. Um, so these days, that's my context, and so uh, audiences are made up of uh, a mix of uh, like French people um, who speak varying degrees of English, um, expats, so English-speaking people who just live in Paris, and tourists. And so these are the people I have to make laugh. And uh, mm. so in terms of coming up with ideas of what I'm going to say to those audiences, naturally, you do end up making fun of Paris and talking about uh, your experiences of, of, you know, struggling with the language and you make fun of uh, France and French people because funnily enough, like uh, French audiences actually kind of like that. Mm-hmm. They, they, they expect, they hope that you're going to talk about them and make fun of those references. So in terms of coming up with funny ideas in this context, um, often you just think about what is going to work and sort of, become aware that the experiences you have difficult and funny experiences you have in the city can can quite easily be converted into a stand-up routine so mm. in 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 one sense it's just about being aware and being attuned so you're living your life and you're always observing and looking for material looking yeah. for sort of ammunition as it were that you can take with you onto the stage and so that means, you know, things like cr- stupid, annoying things that happen, just moments, stuff that happens that 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 kind of allows you to make uh, jokes that everyone can understand. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but then, then there's the more abstract um, idea of how do you come up with funny ideas, mm. and so it's. I don't know really <laughs> it's very hard to it's very hard it's very sort of intuitive you just kind of get you start to get a sense of uh-huh. what kind of rhythms what kind of structures what kind of themes and topics are going to sort of get into you know make people laugh and how, um, how do you know how do you know if if something is fun is funny or not like uh you you've got an idea for a joke or or, or something and how do you what do you do you test it out do you try it with your i don't know with your friends first well first of all you've got your own sense of what you find funny personally and mm. and so that you that guides you but also if you've done quite a lot of gigs mm-hmm. right if you've spent quite a lot of time on stage in front of an audience you start to know what things work and what things don't work so that's really important like stage time it's one of the most important things because really the only way to know if something is funny is to try it and see the reaction it gets. And for example, there are some things that, uh, you know, in the past that I've loved and I've thought are really funny and that I really like, and I've done them over and over and over again in front of an audience and it just hasn't worked. Mm. Maybe because, I don't know, maybe because it wasn't quite Paris centric enough because as I said, the audiences do hope and expect and all understand that thing. Um, you know, you need to talk about something that everyone uh, experiences, something fairly universal. Um, and sometimes I feel like maybe my own personal experience is a little bit weird and a bit too specific. Mm-hmm. It's a bit tricky because sometimes what you want to do is you, you, you have an experience or notice something about the world, about life, and it can it should be very very specific the more specific it is the more incisive it is and often the the funnier it becomes but you've also got to make sure that this very specific thing that you're observing or commenting on is something universal as well so um like for a long time i've been trying to work out how to make fun of uh, the way that people queue mm. or or stand in line in Paris okay and because it's always been like a problem for me and it's just a real sort of um, um, pet peeve of mine that people don't queue properly and it really frustrates me <laughs> and, and I've always tried to work out how to do it and I, and I worked out the specific way to get to it which is that people in Paris jump the queue but then they pr- then when they get caught they pretend they don't understand <laughs> how the system works and like oh. getting <laughs> yeah and and, and i've managed to yeah like oh uh, 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 you know uh 
Fabio, talking about, by the way, talking about uh, comedy is not necessarily the funniest thing in mm. the world. Uh, it ends up being a little bit, sort of, it can be a bit dry. Uh, I've, you know, I say this on my podcast whenever I explain jokes or humour that explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog and you can learn something from it, but the frog dies in the process. Mm. So, you know, by dissecting and analysing comedy and humour, you kind of take the comedy and humour out of it. Um, but so anyway, so you've got to try and find a uh, an observation or comment or uh, something that is very specific, but which taps into a universal experience. Yeah, otherwise people won't connect with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you always, I think, you, what you're trying to do there is to create a connection with with the people who are listening to you. And you said um, that you tried something and it didn't work. Mm. How did you know it didn't work? Because people didn't laugh. Laugh. Okay. <laughs> it's and very you, simple. Okay, and so you expect them to laugh, but they're not laughing. And what what do you do next when people don't laugh at your jokes? So now you're talking about. So I go out on stage and I'm mm. doing things. So when you and 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 uh, you're doing a, a a bit of material or a specific joke and it doesn't get the response you expect, what do you do? Yeah. yeah, but they're not laughing. You're there expecting them to laugh, and they're not laughing. I mean, I would, I would die inside, and oh, I, would, I would want to run away. Yeah, it's horrible. There's no doubt about it. It's absolutely horrible, um, and uh, you die inside a little bit. But you know, again, experience. This is why experience and stage time is so important. That um, you, so you tell your joke or whatever. You do your bit of material, and nothing. Hmm. You just get nothing from them. Uh, now, it, a new comedian might show that that uh, show the pain or show the disappointment or 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 something, you know, or try to try to cover it up in some way. Mm. So it's very tempting to make an excuse to say, "Oh, that's new material," and uh, "Oh, it's or, mm. or 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 something like, "Oh, it's just me then." You know, that can mm. work. That can work. If you like, you know, say, oh, you know, this happens, this happens, and then no one laughs. You go, oh, it's just me then. That can work as a kind of recovery. But the temptation is to somehow sort of uh, almost apologize for it. Mm. Now, you don't say, sorry, I tried something, it didn't work. Mm. I mean, it's sort of pathetic. But um, so what, do you, what you have to do is you don't show any sign of this being, this hurting, because actually, the audience actually want you to succeed. So this is this is a common thing that people expect when they do stand up. They think the audience are going to be against you. Mm. And unless you give them a, a specific reason to be against you, like for example you say something that's cruel or mean or you're just really uh, unlikable in some way or you you're picking on the wrong people, like you're making jokes about homeless people or something. Mm. Which people like I find new comics are always doing this. You know, you always see new comics come out, and they they say, "I was walking down the street and I saw a homeless guy, and he had a mobile phone, and his <laughs> mobile phone's better than mine." What the fuck, right? Um, which is, I've heard that joke a million times, and you know, you're making fun of homeless people, which uh, you know the audience are like, mm, "I'm not sure I want to validate that with my laughter." You know, it's kind of sad. Or you get com comedians who go up and they talk about their their um their private parts mm -hmm. and this is like the, you know it's close to being funny but it's not really because you haven't really created put given us a structure f um so anyway anyway the audience want the comedian to to be funny right they've come to the show they want you to be sure, funny they want yeah. you to be fantastic they want everything to be great they want you to be confident uh, coming up with like great stories, responding to things that are happening in the room. They want the show to be a success. And if you do something that doesn't work and then you show it, you know, you, you, you look down or you kind of uh, stop and you stop in your tracks and you kind of get um, really put off by it, then the audience kind of get, feel really bad for you. And, you know, yeah. so what you, the best thing to do is if something doesn't work, it doesn't matter. You don't care. You know, you yeah. have to be bulletproof and just yeah, just carry on, like, and don't show any sign that it's bothering you at all, even though it definitely hurts. This reminds me of a documentary um, I saw a couple of months ago um, about Jim Carrey, 
um, and he was saying that he would always ask himself what the audience wanted from him. So he would go to sleep and think, what do they want? What do they want? This is him talking. What do they want? And then suddenly he realized um, they want to be free from concern. Yes. And to, to, to let that happen, I need, to, I need to be free from concern. So I need to model that. So if you're free from concern on stage, they too will be, you know, they will, they will, too, they too will be free from concern and not have, you know, not worry about anything. Because you go to a stand-up um, comedy show because you want to laugh, you know, you want to forget about all your problems. So yeah, this reminded me of of that. So if you look down or you look disappointed, then you're transmitting that disappointment to them as well. And the show, I guess, would go. Yeah, you know. everyone starts to feel bad, you know, everyone starts to feel a bit guilty and there's like shame, you know, this feeling mm. of shame comes into it. But it's very tricky because um, it's not as simple as that. You can't just be like, well, I just won't show any shame and I mm. won't I won't feel or, or look bad if, if it doesn't go well. Because as well as that, you also do need material that works and you need a, um, a certain sort of... Um, uh, uh, you know, you, you need you need um, yeah material and a kind of uh, uh, um, what's the what's the word I'm looking for um, uh, like a method. You know, you need to mm. your instrument, which mm. is you, mm. because when you when you're doing music, you have an instrument and you mm. you you know you practice and you learn to be fluent with that instrument. But in mm. stand up, it's just you, your body, your voice, and so this instrument needs to be finely tuned and it needs to be in good condition so that you can operate well and you also need to have the right material that you know well and you also yeah you need to be able to kind of like have that sense of what's funny and what's not funny and you also need to kind of dictate to the audience when to laugh and that's mm. that's timing that's timing but it's also about body language and stuff as well so you kind of it's, it's, it's hard to explain this abs in an abstract way without kind of using examples. But so one example might be, so let's say I've got a, I've got a bit of material about queuing or something, mm -hmm. right? And like I've done my bit, told my little joke. And when you tell the bit that's funny, you kind of almost have to deliver it to the audience with your voice. So you might go down at the end or you might even just use do a certain... Uh, movement with your hands um but it has to kind of be natural but you and mm -hmm. you know you show them this is the moment where you laugh and you, you can actually pause and stop in with a certain attitude on your face if your attitude is like confusion mixed with annoyance um then that's the attitude you stay in when you've delivered the punchline let's say and that kind of like dictates to the audience where they laugh and eventually you get into a rhythm with the audience where you're kind of conducting them. Mm. Um, yeah, I also, Fabio, I realised talking about this uh, in this way, in this serious way, of like, here's how to do comedy. I, mm. I sound like I think I'm like the best comedian. <laughs> well, you and are. I, I'm not, I'm <laughs> not. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a student of comedy just like most of us are. It's very hard to to kind of um, speak with authority about stand-up because, you know... You, it's an you, art. It's an art form and it's it's one way... It, the, 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 as a comedian, uh, I, I am, let's say, uh, reluctant to uh, assume that I know what I'm doing. You should never mm. assume that... You, although you should be confident and you should be going on stage thinking, yeah, this is good, I'm going to be good, this is great, the audience are in... You know, you're listening to the audience, and they say, "Okay, the audience sound good, great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a good show." You should be confident, but at the same time, you also shouldn't um, let yourself drift into uh, like complacency or hubris. You know, where you kind of, for example, where you you kind of think, "Okay, last week I had a great show. I I, I killed. Mm. It was fantastic," and then you've got another show the next week. And because you're feeling so good about the last performance you did, you think, I'm a brilliant comedian now. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm on fire. Uh, then um, you maybe have a couple of beers before your performance and you don't kind of 
go through your material again in, mm -hmm. in you know backstage you know rigorously go through it a couple of times from start to finish to make sure that you really know which what the rhythm's going to be and where you're going to go from here to here to here and what your closing bit's going to be and exactly how you're going to time it and you know you practice 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 if you kind of uh slip and get overconfident then you, you're going to fail because um you know you it's a discipline it really is it's kind of like a, a, a discipline you've got to be fighting fit um and uh so the, i'm reluctant to talk as if i really know what i'm doing because that's kind of a dangerous uh uh, thing to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. In any in any industry or art form, I mean anything. I think we always need to stay a student. You know, stay students. Yeah. Uh, of what you're doing, because the moment you 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 stop learning, the moment you 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 believe you're done, then you're not learning anymore, and you, you won't improve, right? Yeah. Um, I want to ask you something about you said um you talked about cruel cruelty um um so making cruel jokes mean jokes and um i always have this debate with my partner with my girlfriend aloha um about what ricky gervais says about what you can what you can joke about. So he believes, I'm sure maybe you know, that he believes there is, you can joke about anything. Like mm -hmm. you can joke about the Holocaust. You can joke about, um, make jokes about cancer or uh, pedophiles, anything mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, it's not the joke, it's the intention that counts. So not the words, but the intention. And mm -hmm. to him, um, words have no, they can't be violent. Um, I'm, I haven't formed a, 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 an opinion uh, mm. on this. Sometimes I believe, well, he's right. You know, there's stand-up comedy is there to make you forget about the world and, you know, have fun. But on the other hand, well, how can you joke about a child who has cancer? What, what, what would a, a parent who has a child who's got cancer? What, what would they say? Well, I'd say, well, as well, why would you joke about? I mean, mm. that, but that's not my cup of tea. It's not my kind of comedy. I mean, mm. like Ricky Gervais has got his thing, and it's definitely, you know, it's uh, it's very successful for him, and he mm. does talk about controversial things. He talks about outrageous things, and it it really works well for him. Uh, it's not my style at all, and I would never go and and I'm not comfortable mm. making comedy about that stuff. I don't mean to say that he shouldn't be doing it. You know, mm. I agree that in comedy you can talk about whatever you want. I don't know that it necessarily follows that you should. Mm. You know, a, a lot of people have, you know, um, heard all the interviews with Ricky Gervais and other comedians, similar comedians, and you know they they do talk about how. Comedy should be this free space where you yeah. can say anything you want, and um, uh, you know it's like your intention is just to to make people laugh and stuff like that. And people who are offended are kind of just like total losers, and you know offense isn't given, it's taken, and all that stuff. Mm. And it's all about the intention, sure. Mm. But I mean, I I kind of partially agree with Ricky Gervais on that. Mm. I think in terms of humor, yeah, the intention is important, but also the 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 outcome. Uh, is you know a factor too i mean if i don't know if we take another uh subject let's say uh law right mm -hmm. um and uh let's say <laughs> maybe this is an extreme example but like um if you kill someone right mm -hmm. but you didn't intend to do it mm -hmm. but you know your actions led to that person being killed that's still uh, you're still going to go to jail that's still manslaughter mm -hmm. you know that's still homicide if you killed someone you didn't intend to do it you got drunk and because you're like, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to drink and drive because, you know, I can do what I want, right? It's a free country. <laughs> uh, well, no, you have to have responsibility for the outcome of your actions. And if, you know, driving crazily causes you to crash into another car and you kill someone, that's st you're still responsible for it. Uh, comedy and, and crime are not exactly the same thing. But, you know, I think my point is that you still have to have responsibility for the outcome of the things you do 
So I kind of half agree with Ricky Gervais. I agree that comedy, you know, we shouldn't be imposing limits on it because that sort of is against the spirit of the thing. Yeah. The spirit of comedy is that, you know, it should be a free thing. And yeah, we should be uh, able to laugh at anything we want. There should be, for example, no rules or laws passed by the, the government um, which say you can't joke about cancer, for mm. example, that because you might upset someone. Uh, that would be draconian, and uh, that would be too much control. No one is no one is suggesting that there are laws passed, like anti comedy laws that are passed. Whenever this conversation comes up, it's normally about what people consider to be socially acceptable. I don't know. I I, I don't. Know. I don't particularly do have it. a. I, I I wouldn't do it on stage. Mm. Um. I just don't feel the need. Um, uh, you know, I wonder why Ricky Gervais wants to do that. Why does he want to talk about those subjects? Um, well, because um, I, I believe that he he believes in what he says. So he really believes that there's nothing on on this earth that you, you can't joke about. Um, I think it's, yeah, I, it's I, his philosophy. Yeah, it's his philosophy. Um, yeah, but so, I don't understand yeah. that. Like, you, sure, I agree with that. There's nothing you can't joke about. Mm. But then, why, why do you choose to joke about those things? You know, mm. like, you, you know, we should be allowed to, to joke about cancer and about, uh, uh, you know, the Holocaust. But that doesn't mean that then you should be going out to joke, yeah. joke about the Holocaust. And I think, you know, again, talking about some comedians I've seen, some people do take that a little bit literally, and they think, right, stand-up comedy means outrageous being yeah. outrageous and offensive and um i mean i'm not sure that that's that's true i think that um uh, they're close it's again like going back to the thing i said about people who go on stage and start talking about their dick you know <laughs> um it's close to comedy but it's not exactly there it's outrageous and it 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 it's it, uh, it causes a reaction in people people react so the it's like almost like comedy it feels like comedy looks like comedy but is it really is are you not just getting a uh uh shock and uh sort of emotional response mm. i don't know if it's but then you know but ricky gervais can do it because he does it as a you know his his jokes on those things are actually very well done mm -hmm. they fit within the attitude of 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 him as a comedian so you know it works for him and his jokes are well constructed he's he's a brilliant comedian you know he he's able to construct comedy so well and it works for him because he makes us uncomfortable because we oh god he's talking about yeah. oh god he's talking about transgender people now but then you know he relieves that discomfort with a well structured joke okay um so, you know, I, I can't remember who it was who said it, but I don't even know if it is a quote, but there's one theory that humour is is about just relieving tension. Mm. And so a good comedian will will create some tension and then relieve it. Mm. And the nice. result the result is a sort of uh, relief laugh, you know. And he sort of like that's what he's doing is he's kind of like <laughs> bringing these dangerous tricky topics to the table but he's so skilled at what he does he's able to kind of maneuver his way through it and and it's a it's a wild ride it's an exciting roller coaster of like whoa this is with this is taboo uh, <laughs> yeah. but he's do, he's making us laugh he's rewarding us with little laughs as we go through um i don't th I, I i don't know personally if if comedy uh, is serious you know I, I i don't know if if what ricky gervais is doing is making a making many serious points in a debate beyond i should be allowed to say this hmm. he, he made me feel guilty for laughing um that's, that's interesting i mean that, that's it's interesting yeah. what he can do you know yeah. it's interesting that he makes you feel guilty for laughing see what partially what it is is that yeah is he like i said he's got he's employing the comedy techniques the structures it's like magic comedy is closest i think to magic hmm. than than a lot of other things um and also you said yeah i wanted to ask you about how you remember what to say because this is something that i've always um thought about um mm. like i wonder how do people how do stand-up comedians 
remember the jokes? Like, do they have like a, a little, uh, you know, earphones? Earpiece. Yeah, where they, they, there's someone on the other hand who's no. maybe telling them what to say or reminding them. Of- no, no. no was, well, I don't know. It may have happened, but no, I don't think so. But so, so okay. When you watch a Netflix special, hmm. right? Um, what you're watching is like the culmination of maybe a year of doing that show over and over and over again, mm-hmm. many times in a week, sometimes every day for a week. You know, again and again and again for a year. Okay. So when they when they film it, they know the. The, the whole hour or hour and a half, they know it like the back of their hand mm. and they can recite it with every beat in the right place and they edit it. So maybe little bits where they mess something up, they remove those bits from the, from the video. Mm. Uh, so there's that. And those comedians who do those Netflix specials, but you know, even if you don't see a Netflix special, if you just go and see them perform live, like I, I saw Ricky Gervais in Paris oh. um, a couple of years ago and it was amazing, yeah. Like exactly like you said, he just it was it was just all perfectly remembered, and it's like my God, how does he remember this? And then you think, well, he's done this again and again and again and again and again and again and again in this city, this city, this city, this city, this stage, this stage, this stage. You know, he's just done it so many times that you know he he can remember it quite easily uh, eventually. Um, but though all those comedians, when they're building a show, they start from scratch and. They will be doing work in progress shows or little shows in front of smaller audiences where they're working it out. Okay. And often if you do see those shows, and not many people do really in the scheme of things, only the hardcore fans who find out about it and they go down and there's like 50 people in the audience, you'll see the comedian kind of like working it out, forgetting the stuff that they've written, or they might have a piece of paper with all the ideas sketched out on it on the on a stool next to them and they kind of rush back over to the stool and check their notes mm. and all the, the audience are like wow we're really seeing him create the show from nothing <laughs> um you know that's that's kind of like this the the selling point for the audience and they work it out and they try things and th- some things work some things don't work and they improvise a bit and they're recording it on a on a dictaphone or something and, and they can listen back to it. So it's a, it's a craft. It's absolutely a craft. And so the, f- the finished final product, part of, uh, part of that product is making it look like the person is just saying this stuff for the first time. Yeah. yeah spontaneously. That's the craft. It's, it's meant to look spontaneous. It's meant to look like these are just, it's just a stream of consciousness. <laughs> But actually, it's something that's been rehearsed again and again and again. Even the little and the timing, you know, timing should sound and feel spontaneous. If it feels like it's scripted, people don't laugh. But if it feels like it's genuine, like it's happening in the moment, then that's the stuff that works. That's why I say it's kind of like magic because it's sleight of hand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's stuff that you don't notice. You don't notice the work that's gone the into the science it. the science behind it yeah the and, technique yeah. yeah and how do you how do you do it like how do you do all that like do you practice do you like you said you took a course um, yeah. but w- that was what, ages ago that was like 15 years ago okay what what mm. do you do now to improve or yeah to improve your craft basically um, if you do anything it's a bit messy mm. you know my whole process is quite messy, um, uh, but uh, so I've got material that I know quite well now, uh, tried and tested material, we call it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I can, I have to make a decision. If I've got a gig coming up, so um, let I guess uh, when I spoke to you on my podcast, at the end of the episode, we talked about doing this episode and I painted a picture, if you remember. Yeah. I painted a picture of a, a show. Now, repaint it, repaint it, please. W- what show do you want, Fabio? Do you want do you want the show where there's just ten people in the audience? Do you want the show where there's um, uh, fifty people? Do you want the show where there's six hundred people, or do you want the show where there's two thousand people? W- what's the biggest? For two thousand people, but it okay. it's it's rare. It's very it's rare. I've only done a few of those. Okay, and they're they're rare. So let's go for about two hundred people, something like mm. that. Okay, mm. um, so. 
yeah, you know, you can feel nervous. I mean, to be honest, you feel nervous in front of two people, you know? <laughs> Uh, in fact, you feel even more. In fact, to be honest, two people makes you feel more nervous than two hundred people. I have to say. Mm. Anyway, so let's let's say we've got hundred people, right? Let's mm. go for that. And so you, you've known about the gig for a couple of weeks. It's okay, Luke. You're going to do fifteen minutes at this show. There's going to be it's it's at this theatre. There'll be or this club or whatever. There's going to be about you know it's sold out. So there's two hundred people in the audience. Wow, well, sold out <laughs> already makes me feel anxious. If I were you, yeah. For me, that's mm. sold out is good. You, okay, you, that's that's a good. That's really a good thing. It, it, what you what's bad is if you're in a two hundred seater place and there's only fifty people in there, uh, and empty. and mm. what would be worse is if they're all spread out in different places. There's like in the classroom, gap. like in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, when I see when because I teach English as well. When when I was in a in the physical classroom, um, I remember if I had three students. Three there, two there, and one here. I was like, it feels awkward. Yeah, sorry, yeah. go on, go on. Yeah, exactly like that feeling. Yeah. I know exactly the thing you mean, where it's like, there, some of them are over there, some of them are over there. There's no cohesion. You need them to be one block. So if you've got a, a, an audience with lots of empty seats and everyone's spread out, that's really hard to, you know, you have to actually, you might have to say to them, can you all move? I want one block so everyone move in and if you have to do that yourself before your performance that kills the magic too you have to come out and say hello everyone now this is look at the state of this audience can you i need you all to move in the show will not start until you all move in please come in come in i want these seats to be filled before the show begins you got five minutes go and then you disappear again you got to be confident to do that it doesn't usually work like that normally you stand there trying to persuade them to move no one wants to sit on the front because they're scared that you're going to pick on them yeah. <laughs> so you know this is the reality a lot of shows happen like this and you kind of like feel really bad because you're like oh god the conditions aren't right and, oh god and then and then the microphone doesn't work and then the music you know anyway in, uh, so assuming that, that stuff isn't happening, let's say it's sold mm -hmm. out and you know that people have come and they want to come and the room's going to be full and buzzing. Um, so I, have to, I would have to make a decision before that show which material I'm going to do. So mm -hmm. what do you think, Fabio? What shall I do? Shall I try some new stuff that I've been thinking about? Shall I try the stuff that I did for the first time last Wednesday that went really well, but I've only done it once? Or shall I do the stuff I've been doing for five years, which I know will work, but to be honest, I should probably be doing new, newer things because there might be some people in the audience who've seen me before, mm -hmm. and certainly the other comedians at the back who, who have got newer stuff, who are working on new material, they will hear me doing that five-year-old stuff and they'll be like, oh, he's doing that again. So, mm. But it will work. It will definitely kill. So, Fabio, what, what material shall I do? For a sold-out show? 200 people, yeah. Sold out. Sold out. Well, you're in your comfort zone because there are 200 people. And Ish. Ish, okay. Well, it's the, uh, the 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 audience that you're normally performing uh, for, like the, the the. I mean, you're you're not performing in, in front of two thousand people. If you were performing in front of two thousand people, I would go. I would go for my. I would stay in my safe zone. But in this case, I have to I don't say, know. I have to say. By the way, two hundred people is is a big audience for me. Okay. Um, normally, most of my shows are the smaller shows where there's up to 50 people in the room. And every now and then I get to do a bigger room. And then, you know, maybe once a cup, once every year or two, I might do a really big room. Okay. So for a big room like this, maybe I would go for the same old jokes. Right. Okay. I, I think I would choose the same thing. Okay. I'd probably go with some okay. of my tried and tested stuff, but mm -hmm. hopefully somewhere in the mix, there's some new material, which I've been working on that's reasonably mm -hmm. fresh, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you do have to keep coming up with new stuff. Otherwise, otherwise you can get trapped in a situation where you can, you only ever do your tried and tested material and you don't develop new stuff and you don't really move on to new things. The, the problem is that, yeah, you can, you can get stuck with material that you know will always work 
uh, which you know is guaranteed to 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 make people laugh. But as I said, it means you don't develop. So there's always a level of kind of like fear and risk. The fear is like, oh, I'm going to do the same old material I've done before. I feel a bit bad for doing that because it feels a bit like cheating, and I'm, the other comedian, the other comedians might also judge me a little bit for it. Mm. And you know, some audience members might start to notice that I'm just doing the same stuff again and again. Yeah. Okay, so so what I would do is I would try to balance it out. Also, you've got to make a decision about your set. So that's the that's the ten or fifteen minutes that you're going to do. You need to just you need to choose how you're going to open your set, which is really important. Like the first minute, even the first few sentences mm -hmm. are really important, and then the last thing that you do is really important. So you've got to start strong, and you've got to close strong because the closing part is how they remember you. Mm -hmm. So you really want to end on an upward trajectory. And ideally, you want to end on a big, big laugh. And yeah. then, right, that's my time. You've been fantastic. I'm Luke Thompson. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. And then they're like, wow, he was brilliant, wasn't he? Instead, no. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want, you know, like good at the beginning and then good in the middle and then at the end a bit that sort mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, and then you're like, well, anyway, that's my time. Bye-bye. And they're like, uh, they're, no one remembers how good you were five minutes ago. They're just <laughs> left, they're just left with this, this final feeling. So you've got to plan your set where you start with something strong and end with something strong. And, and you can maybe play around with something in the middle, you know, you could that's in the middle, you can maybe do the stuff that's not completely finished yet. And you can work it out a bit. Um, I was wondering how, like, how much is is scripted? So do, do you script line by line? Or do you just just rehearse orally um, before or, you know, uh, uh, before the show, yeah. Somehow, somehow a bit of both. Somehow mm. a bit of both. I feel like I didn't really answer your previous question, which is like how to write. I think. Or how do you prepare? Yeah. Yeah. So I would actually. So if it's if it's stuff I generally know what the set will be, then I'll write it down. So I'll be on my own and I'll write down my set. And I'm and the best way to do it is to stand is to walk around your living room or some space, walking around doing the material. Right, you're kind of like in this weird zone where you sort of try and picture yourself, or at least you try to just link one idea to the next. You've really got to focus your attention and not be distracted by other things. You've got to really try and force yourself to go through the material, go through the set from start to finish. And there might be bits where you kind of like, uh, uh, and you, you know, you don't quite remember what the next line will be, or you don't know what you're going to do next. And you go back and you consult your your notes. And you might have the whole set written out word for word, uh -huh. right? And you, instead of reading it, so you shouldn't, if, if I've written my entire 10 minute set word for word, um, thinking this is definitely the best way it should go, then it, I can't practice by just reading from my page because that's no good because I'm not going to have the page when I'm on stage. So you have to just like not look at the page and then stand up, walk, walk around and try to do the whole set and make it flow, right? Um, and you, you feel nervous, you feel, you can feel really bad, you know, you can feel terrible at times like that, especially like maybe the day of the show, you kind of think, why the hell am I doing this? This is <laughs> stupid, I'm crazy. Oh God, why am I doing this? It's horrible, I don't enjoy this. And then, you keep practicing a bit more, you force yourself to practice a bit more instead of just like, you know, going on Instagram and farting around and wasting your time. You force yourself to practice a bit more. And then you kind of like get to a, maybe some ideas come to you and like, ah, oh, 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 that's funny. You break into like a new area and you, and you like, you, you find a sentence or a line that's worded in a certain way that just seems to work. It feels good. And you're like, ah, this is good. And then you get a little bit of excitement because you think, ah, this is, ha, this is going to work. I know I can smell it. I can feel it. This is going to work. And then and you go and try it. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, you were. Then you, you, you kind of try and repeat it in your head again and again uh -huh. and say it out loud. So you know how you're going to word it. And, you know, you just try to basically get really familiar with it, but there's going to be a bit of, there's most of the time, there's going to be a bit of 
gray area or ambiguity where you can't quite remember or haven't quite decided the wording, but you've got to keep the central idea in place. Um, um, again, we need an example. Um, recently, I came up with some material about the, the Fast and Furious films. Mm. So I, that's the sort of stuff I like to, to do. Like, I like mm -hmm. to make fun of movies and mm -hmm. stupid stuff like that. So uh, and, and I came up with just some ideas. I knew they would be funny just because, you know, after, as I said, after a while, you get a sense of what works and what doesn't work. And you've also got your own personal sense of humor that you can kind of hopefully rely on. And so the the basic idea is the basic idea of the material was um so they've been making the Fast and Furious films for 20 years. They've made 10 films, mm -hmm. right? They've been going for such a long time and they're still furious. <laughs> right? So that's that's yeah. the kind of the core of the idea. And then from the core of the idea, it's really a case of putting it into words in different ways and exploring the fact that, you know, like I, just exploring, there's something funny in there, right? So there's, there's In the core of that, there is something funny of the fact that they've, they've been doing this again and again and again and again and again. And how do they maintain this l consistent level of fury and <laughs> anger over such a long time. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can explore there, a lot of ways to put it. You can say things like, you know, because uh, uh, eventually, you know, you can hold on to anger, but eventually you're just like, oh, you know what, I just, like, I'm too tired to be angry about this anymore. Or you can do, like, in reality, what would it be like? You know, he's like Vin Diesel. How old is he now? He's in his 60s. You know, no yeah. one's got that level of energy to maintain that. So it's going to be the fast and can't be bothered, you know. or this. And anyway, I had all these, This I knew there was a core idea and I just played with it on my own and wrote down the ideas and then I came up with a whole set of material and I ended up with maybe 10 minutes of stuff about the Fast and the Furious, including jokes about every Fast and Furious uh, film title because they're ripe for, 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 for jokes. You know, this, I mean, I, I, I cannot remember any of them. Fast and Furious 1, fine. Fast and Furious, um, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute, yeah, Fabio. I, you might need to edit a little yeah, bit. No, no, that's fine. Um, let me see if I can find. Um, okay. So what I came up with, and I can share this with you. There's like, the, so the, the, there's the material about the Fast and Furious, and then there's the, the titles of the films. So there's a fast, new Fast and Furious movie out. Now, I came up with that because I saw the posters everywhere in Paris, mm -hmm. right? The, mm -hmm. the buses all had pictures of Vin Diesel looking very serious. A lot of people standing next to cars, you know. There's a new Fast and Furious film. It's Fast and Furious 10. How long has the franchise been going now? 10. Over 20 years. That's a long time. Pause. And they're still furious. <laughs> right? Now, you know, I just know that's going to work. I, I mean, okay, I, I did that. I've done it a couple of times. There was one show when it definitely didn't work. But to be fair, it was in front of four people. And oh, it, wow. none of them had seen any of the films and didn't like them. It, they were definitely oh. not the target audience for, for that. So uh, I died on my ass. <laughs> I went through the whole thing and it just like, I just persevered, carried on. Like, okay, the I'll get them in the next line. I'll get them. Okay, the film titles, that's going to get them. But they were just like, no, we don't like the Fast and Furious. Don't talk about that. <laughs> talk about fucking croissants or something <laughs> instead, you know. Um, and even one of them came up to me afterwards and he gave me advice on how to do stand-up comedy, which was interesting. From, from the yeah. audience? Yeah, some guy. Oh. He was like, you know, uh, an expat. He was like, you know, uh, you know you're, you're very funny. You're very funny, but, you know, just... Um, I think you need to work on your material. It's like, okay, great. Yeah, you go ahead and give me a lesson in how to do stand-up. And then, you know, the previous week I'd done that and it went really well, you know, like really, really good. Anyway, so usually anger dissipates after a while. Like eventually like, oh, you know what? I'm too tired to be angry. Not these guys. They're still holding on to that anger and they're always in a rush. I'll tell you one place they're not in a rush to get to, therapy. Because <laughs> that, that would be the end of the franchise. <laughs> It wouldn't be the Fast and Furious. It would be the no need to hurry. We're taking our time. 
the formerly Fast and Furious or the Fast and now it just doesn't seem necessary? And can they even remember why they are furious? Why are we furious anyway? I can't remember. I think it was something to do with cars. <laughs> You know, and then Vin Diesel, he doesn't look furious, does he? He's mainly just looks stoic, unemotional. He's just quiet and calm. The fast and fine, you know. And, you know, the thing about Vin Diesel is he, he just pumped all his fury into his arms, didn't he? Poof, that's where the fury went. <laughs> and then, you know, like with that bit, I can go boom and do this action of boom, pumping all the fury into my arms. That's funny for some reason. Yeah, yeah, Boom. it is. <laughs> so another thing about stand up is it's not just structure, topics, like like um jokes, um, but also noises mm -hmm. and certain words. Certain words are just funny, you know. Um furious is a funny word, I is think. It? Yeah, like I think the, so. The word the word itself, like it It's quite funny, yeah. But mm -hmm. certain words, certain words are funny. Like, um, you know, one day Vin Diesel will be too old for the Fast and Furious, and they'll have to rename it. They'll call it the Slow and Incontinent. <laughs> incontinent, I think, is quite a funny word. Mm -hmm. It's not the funniest, but it's fairly funny. Swear words, normally. Yes. Well, swear words are funny. You, if you add fuck or shit or, you know, a swear word into the routine. It definitely has impact. Um, some people consider it to be lazy, mm. you know, mm. and really you feel a bit better when you get a laugh without using a swear word. Because mm, it's the, the easy way to do it, you think. Yeah, swear word. Like mm. someone, Jerry Seinfeld never swears. You know, he's a mm. purist and he decides, I'm not going to resort to swearing to get laughs. I will get laughs pure laughs like um not without cheating um so the fast and furious can i do the fast and furious uh, movie titles i feel like i want to yeah, yeah go go of so you know after having basically made these comments about the fast and furious the same joke pretty much over and over again which is that why are they still furious you know just exploring making fun of that um Then there's the movie titles. So there's the Fast and Furious, the first one. Second one was called Too Fast, Too Furious. <laughs> It this, is funny this, already. <laughs> this, yeah, this title was written by their parents. <laughs> too Fast, Too Furious, Slow Down, Sit Down, you know. And uh, again, in comedy, you can break off and you can sort of act out the thing that you're talking about. So you can, this is the wonderful thing about stand-up is that it's totally free So as well as talking directly to the audience where you say, too fast, too furious, I think this, this title was written by their parents, you can then become their parents and say, you, you're too fast, too furious, Vin Diesel, sit down, you're, too, you're five years old, you know, stuff um, like that. Yeah, you can, you can, it can take many directions. It depends on, again, what you think is funny. And, uh, but also you, you're performing mainly in France, right? In, in Paris. Yeah, these days, yeah. And like every culture you know we, we all have our ideas of what's funny and what's not um have you found any differences between french and and british people um it's In hard to say mm. hard to say certainly the the uk audience i think a uk audience is very comedy literate mm. do you know what i mean so so a british audience They will come to the show with a different mindset. They'll come thinking that they are experts in comedy. Oh, okay. Because they, you know, they'll think I I live, breathe stand up comedy. I'm a kind of a con connoisseur Ooh. of comedy. A lot of British people feel like that. And so you've got to be extra clever, extra original. Hmm. Otherwise, you'll they will just be like, mm, no, that, I found that a bit unoriginal, or I found that to be a bit hackneyed, or something. Hmm. Um, hmm. Um, and and French audiences, they're coming to a comedy show in English, and I, they do it. I don't know if they expect it or they realize it, but you have to do stuff about France or Paris. And I, I, in my experience, if you don't do that, if you don't talk about them, okay. then, then they, don't, they don't really relate to it that much. So, 
Okay. Have you ever got... tried? Have you ever tried doing something else? Yeah, lots of times. Yeah, uh -huh. and you know, sometimes it works, but often if you get like a an audience that's mostly French, so you know, again, backstage or wherever it is, <clears throat> at the side of the stage or at the back or whatever, at, when the show begins, you kind of listen to the to the host talk to the audience. And the host will be doing crowd work and sometimes at some point the host will say so where's everyone from if you're french make some noise and french people so what you what they might do is they won't make noise they'll put their hands up that's a bad sign mm -hmm. right because a french audience hasn't been trained to be a stand-up comedy audience a, a, a stand-up called comedy audience in the uk know that they should be rowdy and they should be making a lot of noise okay. rowdiness you know so you know they know that a response from the audience should be yay of course right? yeah, yeah that's what so, i would do too right well a lot of the time for some reason audiences in paris Depends on the audience again. Depends on the demographic that you've got in the room. But every now and then, you seem to we. Depending on the show, sometimes you just get a room full of people who've sat down. They've take they taken their coats off and they've put their coats over their. On, they've put their coats on their laps, and they are a theatre audience. They think that they are coming to a theatre show, which is a different thing. You know, a theatre show is a different, totally different beast, isn't it? And I've seen those sorts of audiences before um not laugh because they think it's inappropriate to make mm -hmm. noise i've seen before i've done been do doing my material uh a guy laugh and his wife next to him uh, elbow him in the ribs oh like you're embarrassing me oh wow <laughs> this <Yeah>. is like <laughs> a certain kind of french politeness uh -huh. where you know you have to be well behaved in uh -huh. the theater um and then I've also seen uh, someone laughing and someone on a, uh, in another seat turn round and give a dirty look to the person who laughed. It's very strange. Maybe these, you, these are theatre audiences who've come to the show because they know it's in English and they are like, let's go and see the show in English. It'll be good for our English. So they're English. there for the English. They're not there for the laughs. <laughs> and they're there studying. It's like if they could, they'd have their notebooks out. You know, wow. but... So you do get that sometimes. Uh, uh, so the the host says, uh, you know, who's from France? And what you want is like a, yeah, and sometimes they'll put their hands up, you know, uh, and you're like, oh, God, we don't want that. We don't want hands up. We want noise coming out of your mouth, you know, because uh, that creates the right atmosphere. If if the audience is noisy, then the rest of the audience will will be noisy too, you know. You just need a certain percentage of the audience to be laughing and making noise and that makes the others feel comfortable to laugh and make noise you need a i don't know what the tipping point is but you know you need a when you get a certain amount of noise in the room then you're going to get more noise whereas yeah, if you can't yeah, get contagious, beyond it's contagious yes exactly yeah you need the sort of uh, contagion point i don't know how to describe it um or you get so who's from france and they go Ray! and you're like great okay so they're french but they speak english well and they understand the codes of this situation and then you get okay who's not from france and then you get like a really loud Ray! and then you can kind of go ah oh, you're so proud not to be french aren't you <laughs> and that normally gets a laugh you can start playing the the sides off each other but anyway you're backstage you're listening to this interaction at the beginning and you're trying to get a sense of what kind of audience you've got in the room and you know whether they're young what the level of english is um, what the sort of general vibe is in there and that helps you decide Just, um yeah what was the question fabio i'm sorry if, if there was um this was actually a question from one of one of my listeners, uh, Daniel mm. Goodson, who's a podcaster, and you, you know him as well because he yeah. was on your podcast. Um, well, yeah. If um, he? He, uh, or he, you were on his podcast, also. yeah, he hasn't been on my show yet, but you know, okay. who knows? Coming soon to Luke's English podcast. <laughs> How do you find the humor? Okay, this was his question. How do you find the humor differs between British and French culture? So, if there are any differences uh, between the british and the french culture in, with regards to to humor like what it's, people find funny so the, um i have to make a distinction between humor and comedy here so there's comedy ah. which is a show on stage uh -huh. and humor 
which is, I mean, obviously the, th the two things mix up, but humor for me, I define it as being like the social situations. So how we, how we um, use humor in our social life. So you're standing around with coffee or, mm -hmm. or some beers or something. And so uh, that's humor, that's social humor. And I, I feel like they're slightly different that in France, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say. I was going to say that in France, people poke fun at each other a bit more. Mm -hmm. But then in the UK, we take the piss out of each other all the time. We always make fun of each other, our friends. Um, in the UK, we like to make fun of ourselves. There's quite a lot of um, uh, self... Um, Ir irony, is that? Yeah, irony and where you make jokes where you are the butt of the joke. Mm -hmm. And so you don't make it obvious, but you're kind of talking in a way that is a sort of modest, self-deprecating kind of humour. And sometimes I've noticed, I don't know if this is just like a language issue, mm -hmm. if it's just the level of English or level of French being used that isn't quite sophisticated enough to get these nuances. Mm -hmm. um, but I have noticed that often if I'm doing that, people don't quite pick up on it and they don't know how to roll with that kind of banter where it's like I'm making fun of myself and you need to make fun of yourself too. Uh, and we're sort of like, you know, uh, instead, what people fall into in Paris is this second degree humor, which is where you basically being ironic, but you're also just shit talking about the people you're with. So you're just yeah insulting the people around you, but you're doing it in second degree. So it's okay. You know? Yeah. Um, so when you roll into that situation with self-deprecating humor, I feel like people don't know, what are you doing? Why are you making fun of yourself? We should be doing that. <laughs> you know, you know, like, uh, um, so, uh, um, yeah, slight subtle differences in that regard. In terms of stand-up comedy, um, I think that just stand-up has been, been around in our culture in the UK for a bit longer yeah. than in France. In France, there's definitely, to an extent, it's still a theater culture. And it's like an intellectual kind of thing. Uh, it's that to an extent. But stand-up is more and more established here. And, and it's kind of um, a bit more um, alternative. Um, it's also fairly ethnic. So you tend to get sort of like uh, North African um, communities. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, people from those communities are doing stand-up. And so it's kind, it, it has been, it's less so these days, associated with a certain ethnic sort of um, culture as well, rather than just everyone. Um, so it's not quite kind of fully encompassed culture in France to the same extent that it has in the UK mm, and yeah. in the US. So you still don't, the audiences still don't know exactly what the rules are a lot of the time. French audiences, they don't always know the rules. It depends. You can get some people who, who, are, who, who are quite uh, uh, familiar with the sort of the cultural codes of a stand-up show, and then you get some audiences that aren't, and they're in the theatre mindset. So I think maybe that's the difference from the comedy that the, the 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 familiarity that the audience has with what stand-up is and how it works and what the audience is expected to do. And also then maybe slight differences in, in humour in the sense that, you know, self-deprecation and in, 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 in the UK, self-deprecation and surrealism and weirdness mm. um, are quite common. Whereas in France, you tend to get slightly more direct um, stuff. But I, I don't know, really. I, I'm, not, I'm not a full expert on the sort of sociology of, of, <laughs> of, of the humour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you also your ambitions. So in terms of um, as a stand-up comedian, what, what, who, who would you like to be? <laughs> like, are you planning to be really big like uh, Ricky Gervais or are you happy with what you're doing and you just get on with what you're doing? That's a really great question, and I think a really important question because mm -hmm. maybe we can take uh, an example of one of my friends here. Mm -hmm. um, so my friend Paul Taylor, who's been on my podcast a lot, he's a regular guest. Mm -hmm. So my my listeners will be will be familiar with him and his story. But um, so Paul and I, um, he's he's English too, 
Uh, he's a bit younger than me, but we kind of, in terms of doing stand-up in English in Paris, we uh, kind of started here in this scene at pretty much the same time, doing the same kinds of shows. Uh, and then, um, and he was also working, you know, so I, I've got my day job. Actually, stand-up is like the third thing on my list. I've got uh, probably podcasting is first, English teaching second, and stand-up is third. They kind of mix up to an extent. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a bit of mixing up going on, but still in terms of the time I have available, stand-up is the third thing on the list. And really to make it, to really make it as uh, as big as you can in mm -hmm. stand-up, you have to only do that. Anyway. Okay. Paul and I sort of started doing comedy around the same time, doing the same kind of shows. We used to do a two two man show where I would do half an hour, he would do half an hour, or he would do half an hour, then I would do half an hour. You know, um, and then Paul made the decision that he would quit his job. He w had quite a good job at Apple, the, the company, in mm -hmm. sort of like corporate training and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, he had a good job with them. He decided to quit that job in order to devote his time to doing stand up. So wow. he he made a conscious um, career choice, which was to devote himself to doing stand-up comedy and to really give it a shot, right? Uh, so he was very clear in his aim and his ambition. He's like, right, I'm going to do this. I want to take this as far as I can take it. Let's see how I can how far I can go. He quit. You know, he 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 had some difficult times. He went to the Edinburgh Fringe and had a horrible experience and struggled and struggled. He built his own one-hour show, his first one-hour show, which he decided would be a bilingual show, which was a really interesting thing because he speaks French and English. Okay, so he, he does it both in French and English. Like so, he does his he, his first show was done in both French and English. So, wow. like maybe five minutes in French, then five minutes in English, five minutes in you know, and so on. And it worked. It worked really, really well. It was a huge success. Also, he recorded a couple of. YouTube videos, which went viral. He essentially converted his stand-up material into YouTube videos, mm -hmm. uh, like sketches, and they went viral. And on the back of that, he got like a TV series, like a mini series on Canal Plus on French television, okay. uh, doing like three minute, um, three minute episodes, which they put on on the TV, and they also put them on a YouTube channel. They went viral, huge hit, and uh, with this momentum. He developed his one-man show, this this bilingual show, in a smaller a small room, and then a bigger room, and then a bigger room, and then after maybe a year or a year or two, he was able to do that show. He toured it around the country. He performed at one of the biggest venues in Paris, doing this one-hour show. Um, his uh, his one of his viral videos got featured in on the BBC and all this stuff. Famous, um, he, yeah, huh. pow. Ooh, rocket to success exactly um meanwhile i'm i'm still there in the same room <laughs> um i mean uh why you know, why what like how come because, because you, you well, haven't tried or well several reasons one is that paul decided he was going to go for it so he threw okay. himself intentionally mm -hmm. yeah he, he 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 went for it and put all his energy into doing it and all his time into doing it he didn't have other things going on it was just that and it was really a conscious choice of like, well, you only live once. You know, I, mm. I don't want to grow old and realize that I didn't try this mm. and regret the opportunity, you know. Yeah. Well, I totally understand, right? I mean, you know, if he was on his, he's in his in his 70s or something and he's old, and he's like, oh God, I just, <laughs> I just worked for an Apple Corporation and didn't follow my dream. He's going to end up miserable. Um, so he was right to do that. So he spent all his time on it, devoted on it, devoted himself to it. Also, he, he was able to uh, use his skills to his advantage, being able to speak English and French fluently, you know, flawlessly, both of them, was, you know, a really original selling point. And he was able to be funny in both languages. And so he was able to get, you know, like get French people to laugh at his jokes um, without them needing to be excellent at English while also providing them with some comedy enjoyment in English, which is what they, a lot of people are looking for, uh, while also allowing uh, English speakers in Paris to enjoy his comedy, but also to enjoy his comedy in French a bit. And that's the magic of it, that yeah. he would do a few minutes in French and the audience would, like the non-French speaking audience would understand a bit, but then, and then after a couple of minutes, there's more English and so they're able to get that. And it was really clever. 
He breached huge, the gap, uh, the, yeah. the cultural gap between the two countries. Yeah, cultural linguistic gap. Yeah. So and um, you know major major success. Uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, I'm just doing it only in English, uh, and not tapping into the kind of French speaking comedy world, which is a whole industry and a world. So I'm not really part of that because uh, my French isn't. I feel like you know ready. <laughs> for that you know and 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 to be honest I wouldn't want that I wouldn't want to be in a in a TV studio in France you know just about to go on live television and to have the world you know the country listening to me trying to you know be funny in French is just the idea is terrifying to me so I never I didn't want I don't want what what Paul achieved you know mm -hmm. so yeah the reason so for me what's my goal my ambition my ambition with stand up has always been just make this room that is in front of me now laugh as much as I can make them laugh and enjoy what I'm doing and just have fun and just work on on my my craft and you know so it's just really short term goals all the way through just like one gig to the next just try to okay, be funny okay. and just try to just try to develop my skill set and um meanwhile my main thing is my podcast and well the podcast really yeah, because yeah. you also try. You can also try out your jokes, but you don't on on your podcast. But ah. how do you know? Ah, there. Well, there's yeah. There's another thing. I can't. I I'm. I don't. I've got like maybe an hour or maybe more. I've got my own one man show that I could be doing, but I'm not for various reasons. Because to be honest, it's just too complicated, too difficult, too, too. It's it's horrible trying to manage a, a, your own show because you've got to do all the marketing, you've got to get people into the room, you've got to negotiate with the owner of a venue, you've got to split the the, you've got to make decisions about whether you're selling tickets. If you sell tickets, you've got to, you know, try and get people Business. to buy them. Uh -huh. If you do a free show, then you and ask for a hat on the door. You've got to work out how the venue gets their money. And, you know, it's just a whole world of like business and marketing that I have no interest in at all. I just want to do comedy and I'm happy to do other people's shows, you know, and be featured as a comedian on other people's shows and be invited by Paul. This is how I've done those rooms of like, you know, 600 people or 2000 people. It's Paul who has said, hey, I'm doing this show. Do you want to open for me? You can do five or 10 minutes before my main show. And mm. so I get to do five minutes in front of 2,000 people, which wow. is incredible. Or he says, I'm doing a, a, a showcase where I've got two English-speaking comics and two French-speaking comics. It's at the Apollo Theatre in front of 600 people. You can have 15 minutes. I'm like, yes, please. So Paul opens the show, he hosts the show, and then he goes, and now Luke Thompson and I come out and I do 15 minutes in front of, you know, 600 people. You've got the right friend. You've got the right friend. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, riding right. on his coattails a little bit. Mm. Um, but yeah, so my ambition is just, has always been just make this particular room laugh and and develop and enjoy myself. Great, so you just, you just basically... Um, you don't have big expectations. Just take what comes. From, yeah, I don't know Paul. really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Paul. <laughs> take what Paul gives to me. Yeah, I don't know really. I mean, I, I used to. I, I did have a an idea. I did have the a vague ambition to do my own solo show, and um, you know, I did do some one hour shows on my own, um, and it was good. You know, it was good, and I, I could definitely do it. But this, as I said, there's just all this other stuff that I don't necessarily want to be involved in. And also, mm -hmm. you know, I had a daughter, so five, five and a half years ago, when I was maybe in a position to make a choice about what am I going to do? Am I going to do a poll and try and push this? And I was like, no, I've we just had a kid and I want to be at home. And, uh, you know, doing stand up, you've got to be out in the evenings. Um, you end up staying up quite late. You know, and, and during the day, you're kind of useless because you're stressed out about the show you're going to do that evening. And, you know, and I need to be working on my podcast and doing my teaching. And so it's just like, nah, it's, nah, it's, a, it's not. priority number three yeah. on, on the list. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I'm having a fantastic time and, you know, yeah. yes, I couldn't ask for more. Yeah. Um, maybe we could end with um some quotes about humor what do you think because sure i've got some quotes from big people like big famous people most of them have 
dead. Are dead, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can share maybe, I don't know, what you think about it, like whether you agree with, with this or not. Mm. Um, so quotes on humor from a book called Advanced Banter uh, by Stephen Fry. Actually. Stephen Fry, okay. Yeah. The prologue. Yeah. Prologue? Is that the right? Prologue, prologue yeah. Yeah. Um, Preface. Okay, so let's see. Um, from Nietzsche. Okay, Ooh. you know this guy. Yeah. In the whole of the New Testament, well, this is religion, which is, I don't think we... Because it's a great start, Fabio. <laughs> uh, uh, a quote about comedy in the whole of the New Testament. What? Okay. Is that... <laughs> Go on, I want to know what it is now. In the whole of the New Testament, there is not one, there is not one joke. That mm. fact alone would invalidate any book. Well, yeah, now you're asking for a comment on religion. Yeah, I do, <laughs> the Bible is not a funny book. It's, it's, it's deadly serious, isn't it? And with the deadly emphasis on the, serious. Yeah. Emphasis on the deadly, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a deeply serious book. And um, I mean, phew, okay, phew, let's yeah, I'll leave that one to Ricky Gervais <laughs> or Monty Python. Yeah. Although, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, I mean, uh, have, you, have you ever seen Ricky Gervais's uh, uh, material about um, Noah's Ark? Yeah. I've I seen love that. that. Yeah, it I goes for like five minutes, pointing at the two birds. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> and people I, I love that. Just, yeah. yeah, exactly. That's what I like about his that routine. So he's uh, listeners. I don't know if you're all aware of it, but it's Ricky Gervais in one of his shows. I can't remember which one. He he does maybe 10, 15 minutes about the story of Noah's Ark. You know, the animals going in two by two. And he uses a book that he had as a kid at school. Uh, it's like a children's book telling the story of, of Noah's Ark. And um, so on one hand, you could be saying, OK, so he's he's this is serious because he's making fun of religion. Yeah, mm. he's like uh, this is you know, he's make, having a sh having a pop at God. Yeah, go on, Ricky. For the atheists, you know, like showing how re how ridiculous religion is. Yeah, you know, free speech. Um, but uh, but actually, when you watch the routine, it's a lot of very silly jokes, which is yeah. what I like. You know, like he's just the, the thing that always cracks me up is when he's talking about the animals going to the ark and they're rushing towards the ark. Like there's the elephants, like <laughs> rushing in. There's like a lot of dust in the air. Just all these animals, like tigers leaping forwards and then there's two crows just strolling just <laughs> just strolling baby just when he says just strolling baby that just always cracks me up so yeah well i mean that's comedy for me it's just the ridiculousness uh, put, of it yeah i'll have to put the link in the show notes to that uh to that clip yeah um so let's move on uh let's see uh, what have we got um okay plateau serious things cannot be understood without laughable things nor opposites at all without opposites mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i understand that relative relativism or something like um if everything is if everything what's what's the second thing he says serious things and blah blah and the second thing nor opposites at all without opposites right so if you just get one thing like the opposite thing helps you understand what this one thing is yeah. right yeah you know like we're, if there is no um how to describe this i don't know black and white or um okay in a james bond film right the baddie always looks like the opposite of james bond well not always but often there's like a few james bond films where the bad guy is mm -hmm. blonde Hmm. I haven't seen any of those. Like, you haven't seen any of those those no. blonde baddie James Bond films or any James Bond films? Any, any right, James okay, Bond, yeah. Okay, let's just make it bigger. Action movies or Hollywood mm -hmm. movies, there's mm -hmm. the hero, and often the enemy of that hero is often a, a, a binary opposite mm -hmm. to the hero, right? So if it's um, uh, Bruce Willis in um, Die Hard, he's kind of like short and normal and kind of a bit balding he's wearing a vest and he's just an ordinary guy and then his his nemesis is like this very tall very muscular uh unemotional guy with long blonde hair and there, there is, there's certain things are opposite between the two yeah. of them and that's done on purpose in order to make us to to, to, to flesh out the hero 
so that we he's defined in opposition to someone else, right? Yeah. Our hero is defined in opposition to other, someone else. If Bruce Willis didn't have that antagonist, another antagonist in Die Hard is also sort of opposite to Bruce Willis. He's intellectual, he's European, he's um, Alan Rickman, he's kind of sophisticated, wearing a suit, intellectual European guy, sort of upper class... And, and and that also informs Bruce Willis that it reinforces the fact he's an ordinary working class blue collar American guy. And so with without these opposites, Bruce Willis would have no depth or roundness to him. So is that what Plato is talking about, that we need these opposites? So similarly, a serious subject somehow without being able to be funny about about it mm. the serious subject loses something it loses dimension or, or something like that mm. so this i think this is the the quote that ricky gervais would would love again like mm. serious things cannot be understood without laughable things uh maybe maybe so if i'm if i joke about uh the war does that mean that i will be more able to understand war I don't know. Mm. I don't know, Fabio. But I do mm. know that there was a movement uh, around the time of the First World War mm. um, in in like a sort of in intellectual arts movement, um, uh, Dada, Dadaism. Have you heard of it? So it's no. a, a art movement. Uh, one of the pioneers of it was, oh God, what was his name? A French or Belgian artist mm -hmm. who presented in an art gallery um, a uh, a toilet a latrine uh -huh. right and at the time that, i mean these days that's normal right you go to an art modern art <laughs> gallery is something ridiculous <laughs> like oh yeah all right fine it's uh, hard. but in those in those days that was like quite an extreme thing and the idea was okay well you know because of the because of world war one there's all these people being sent out for these needless deaths just so much death and um pointless ridiculous uh, death that okay fuck it here's a toilet this is art now <laughs> you know uh yeah. you know it was a reflection of the ridiculousness of this deeply serious situation okay. in order to somehow i don't know express that idea or to react against it there was this surreal mad um movement in art that sprung out of it that kind of surrealism madness ridiculousness um, folly, you know, it, it can be a kind of response to something very, very, very serious and, and uh, yeah, I don't know quite uh, what point uh, I'm making here. Uh, okay. I was, about to, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask you, how do you know these things? Uh, I don't know, just reading about it and, okay. you know, like trying to understand uh, Monty Python, mm. uh, M Monty Python film. I d I've done a few episodes about it and I've tried to get to the bottom of it and mm. that led me to sort of trace the history of that kind of surreal comedy back to Dadaism. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting. topic for sure. Yeah. Um, let's see, one, one or two more. Mark Twain, so from, from your country. No, he's American, isn't he? Uh, Mark Twain. Oh, oh, gosh. Huckleberry Finn. Okay, we have to edit Yeah, he's this American. Out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Samuel Longhorn Clemens, known by the pen name Mark Twain, was an American writer, humorist, entrepreneur, publisher, and lecturer. Did he not live he in was, England? He was, praised, he was praised as the greatest humorist of the United States has ever produced. Uh, and William Faulkner called him the father of American literature. So, Okay, so I won't you. talk about literature <laughs> anymore in my life. Um, the secret Edit source of humor itself is not joy, but sorrow. There mm. is no humor in heaven. Oh, that's good. There's no humor in heaven. Hmm. Yeah. What, heaven could be a bit boring. Just a, <laughs> just a thought. Like, it's just clouds. Clouds. You know. Yeah. Oh, what God, else? another cloud. All good <sighs> people around. Yeah. Nothing happens. Yeah, no good music. Just. Mm. Yeah, no heavy metal. And, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, uh, what was the quote again? <laughs> uh, the secret source of humor itself is not joy, but sorrow. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And on stage, on stage, this is a good thing to remember that often painful experiences or hardship, difficulty converts really well into, into stand up. And 
there are you know some comedians who are really good examples of this richard pryor I don't know if you're familiar with Richard Pryor. Mm. Oh, you must I know the out. faces, but not the but not the names. You, you will know his face definitely, uh, along with um, George Carlin. Richard mm -hmm. Pryor is definitely one of the kind of fathers of modern stand-up comedy, um, and mm -hmm. um, had a very tough background. And a lot of his comedy was about pain. For example, he did you know hilarious routines about when he was young, trying to be a boxer. And the pain of being punched in your side, just like he, he really embodies, he, you know, does, does these routines where he's pretending to box and he's like, yeah, I thought I was really good. And then, you know, and just showing, it's, I can't, there's no way I can recreate it. But so all his routines always involve some level of pain and he's so good at doing it. Um, and, you know, having a heart attack, he does a routine about having a heart attack and it's obviously really serious and really horrible but the way he did it was so funny and so vivid and so life affirming really and that's the the bet when comedy is at its best hmm. you know when i talked before about like a one hour show mm -hmm. and they're 40 minutes into the show there's a real rhythm going maybe they're sweating and the audience are like really in tune with them you know everyone's lost that sense of time and it's life affirming stuff you're laughing and often laughing because you're recognizing truths about what it means to be a human being. Lovely. And you're, you're recognizing, like, the, the comedian is expressing feelings and thoughts and observations that you've noticed and observed yourself, but you've never put into words. Yeah. And have never been fully realized in such a vivid way, and uh, such a human, um, um, fallible way in front of you before. Uh, that you know you you laugh you know what is a laugh you know it's it's hard to define what laughter is and why it happens but you sometimes the best kind of laughter is when you it's a laughter of recognition and of 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 uh, you know uh, of recognizing a feeling or an idea that just is tangible to you but you've never really expressed it you know, yeah, before. I heard uh, Matthew Dix, um, who's a storyteller, master storyteller from the U from from the US, mm. um, who says he also does some stand up comedy, and he says that humor is well. His stories that he tells on stage are also very funny. They're not; it's not stand up comedy, but it's they are funny. And um, he says that humor comes from like is ignited by surprise. So when you're yeah. not expecting something, but suddenly, boom, it's there. That's why it's uh, like magic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Surprise again. Yes. Uh, and you have to be able to, like a good comedian would be able to create that surprise. So you're talking about something like your joke before about uh, Fast and Furious. Um, like they, they've done, what did you say? And they're, they're still furious. Like no one would expect you to say that. Like it's something unexpected. And that... I think what makes people laugh. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. And this is the kind of the one of the keys to uh, understanding how to make jokes as well. It's about taking people in one direction and then shifting it and moving them in another unexpected direction. Mm -hmm. And that's you can do that in many different ways. You know, mm -hmm. you can just sort of set things up and move things that way, and then take a different perspective on it. And in that comedy course I talked about, that was one of the things that we worked on. Mm -hmm. None of us understood what we were doing when we were working on it, but he would give us statements. And we, have to, we had to come up with afterthoughts that would somehow redefine the statement. So he would, you know, the, the first few weeks of the course, we were like, huh? We didn't know what we were doing. But eventually you start to get used to it and you start to think in that kind of way. So I was thinking about, thinking about you, Fabio, and if you went up and did a, a stand-up show, mm -hmm. What would you do? What would be your first, what would be the first thing you would say? And I was thinking the first thing, now we could go for something very obvious. I'm shitting myself right now. Like, yeah, that's like, funny. This is what I would say. <laughs> the first, first, yeah. first thing that I, so. That's, that's funny. But what's the next thing you say after that? Um, do you have any toilet paper or anyone? Sure. <laughs> no. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Another thing I was going to say, which was, again, fairly obvious and potentially quite hackneyed. Mm -hmm. hackneyed. Hackneyed. Hackneyed meaning unoriginal, uh -huh. not, you know, kind of cliched. Mm -hmm. 
you know and and when i said before about british audiences being experts in comedy connoisseurs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they don't like hackneyed stuff stuff mm -hmm. that's been done lots of times before mm -hmm. until it's become a cliche mm -hmm. but sometimes you've got to do a little bit of hackneyed stuff to guarantee a, a laugh and then you can be the original guy you know but you know sometimes a little bit of hack if you're doing it in a knowing way it's it's okay uh, but so it, at, the, at a risk of being hackney, you could come out and say, I'm Fabio and I'm Italian, right? And then you've got the afterthought. So the, th the, the thing you say after that uh -huh. would be the thing that contextualizes it in a funny way. But it's hackneyed. It's basically making fun of your origin or, your, you know, it's like country humour. Okay. Like, I'm Italian, so I like pizza. And, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Uh, but you'd have to find another much more sophisticated way of doing that, where you get much more specific than just, I'm Italian, so I like pizza. It would be, I'm Italian, so, and then something, I don't know. Or it would be, so, hi, I'm Fabio, and you can tell from the sound of my voice or you can tell from my name that... And they're all expecting you to say, I'm Italian, but then you say something else. I don't know what that is. This is the thing that needs to be written, but that something else could be the, the switch that makes them laugh. And if that something else is true and also specific, that can be a great joke. Do you see what you see? Yeah. See how it works? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I would have to think about this very, like, deeply. Like, I haven't ooh. got the. Uh, I haven't got the answer, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I wish I actually, I wish I actually had the uh, the punchline to that particular joke. But you can see by, um, you know, explaining how at least you you try to create it. You know, you create the setup and what you what you want to achieve. You know, you can see how kind of making a joke. Works yeah, there a is uh, there is like there are techniques and strategies. And by the way, um, Matthew Dix has a course on, uh, on humor. Like he, he teaches 25 strategies to, uh. and uh, he shares three. I, I think I remember only one, um, anal simuli or anal no simuli. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you, you basically compare two things. You say that one thing is similar to another thing because, um, but I can't, I can't give you an example yeah. now because I'm not a... Yeah, like this mm -hmm. is like this. So it's like yeah. kind of saying, so um, uh, what would it be like? Um, yeah, like fa the Fast and Furious, they're all really old now, but they're still driving around really fast. That's like, that's like blah, 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 blah. You yeah. know, something yeah. else, which is, you know... Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know? <laughs> uh, there was one, um, I actually... From an Italian comedian, he says uh, that trying to, I can't remember what it was, the first part of the of the simuli, but the second part was, it's like trying to save a, a man who's drowning with a, by throwing him um, a life jacket made of concrete. Yeah. Like something like that. Yeah. So. That's like if you, if you, 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 the way you'd make that work is that you'd, so the, the, Throwing the drowning man a life jacket made of concrete is clearly a situation where one person's in a river and you're trying to save their life. But you could then convert, you could s can compare that to, let's say, overhearing uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend having an argument and you, you choose to step into the argument. You're in a McDonald's and you hear the couple having a big argument and you think, I'm going to help. And you step in in order to, and you, you say something that you think is going to help the guy but it's definitely not the right thing to say. And then this is like throwing uh, a drowning man a life jacket made of concrete, you know. You basically just killed him yeah. by saying the thing you said, you know. So yeah. again, I'm, we're, I'm, I keep giving half jokes here, which is probably very unsatisfying for the audience because well. they want to actually hear the whole thing. But, you know, I'm trying to bring everyone into the mind of the comedian to see how we see things. That, yeah, you definitely do compare one thing to another thing and it reveals the core idea, the core joke in that situation, which is like you, you, you try and help someone, but you actually do the opposite. Exactly. Um, that would and, be and that would be something that make people laugh. That's funny. That's it's funny. funny. You know, it's yeah. tragedy. It's actually a tragedy. Yeah. You know, going, it is going tragic. Back, going back to there's no humor in heaven. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's like the yeah. the sadness, like pain and sadness is, and tragedy is actually the 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 where the, the two sides of the same thing. You know. So yeah, a man drowning. He's already drowning. 
he he's got his he's you know using his last gasps of breath he's holding his arms out like help please help and you're like don't worry i'll help you <laughs> and you grab a thing and because you're a complete idiot you throw it to him not only uh does it whack him on the head it also pulls him down to the bottom of the 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 mm -hmm. sea or whatever it is um yeah that's a, just a tra that's yeah. just a tragedy just a tragedy let's but end on on a tragedy then my tragedy tragedy yeah um yeah. No, I don't know why I'm saying this. Well, I, uh, yeah, there's definitely tragedy in 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 my material. Your life. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Well, there's tragedy in everyone's life, especially yeah. at the end. <laughs> yeah, we all die. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And we all. Uh, it's not just the dying that's the hard part. There's all the other shit that happens before you die. Sorry, but <laughs> uh, well, okay. So <laughs> there's no. I, I can't imagine anyone escaping tragedy in their life. All you need to do as well is just open your eyes and look at the news. It's just tragedy. Exactly. Anyway. Like, especially just, now. But it, let's yeah. not and go there, maybe. No way. Uh, and any time. There's just tragedy constantly, all the time. So the uh, job of the comedian is to turn that tragedy into something that, may, something that makes yeah. people laugh. Yeah, just mm. to try to... Because what, what else can we do? What are we going to do? We ha you have to laugh. Cry. You have to smile. Mm. Yeah, you could. But, you know, you got to got to laugh so the job of the comedian is to let everyone it basically is to give people permission to laugh but also to let everyone feel he, real human experience but to laugh about it because you could easily really strongly consider your human experience honestly without any filter you have a good strong hard look at what it really means to be a human and you could be made sad by it because there is a lot of tragedy people we love we will lose them you know we'll lose everything you know we only get to experience this once there's ultimately there is a huge deep level of tragedy in in life uh but yeah if you flip that and you turn that into comedy and it's like it's okay we can laugh about it that is a wonderful thing i genuinely this is why i love comedy sincerely that i love going up in front like people say to me why do you do that the idea is terrifying yes it is terrifying it is terrifying but if you've got if you've got material that you've done before and you know it works or you've got an idea and you're sure it's going to work and you know exactly how you're going to say it and the audience is just ready for it and you go up and you do it and you time it and you do your physical movements right you've got your facial expressions right and they laugh and they applaud and everyone has a wonderful time that's a very wonderful and uh pure good feeling and good thing to do and so that's why i love stand-up comedy because it's ultimately it can be a very um you know a very wonderful thing you know it's beautiful isn't it that's all my time you should go now <laughs> i've been luke thompson you've been fantastic good night <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can end here with this, like with this um, philosophical reflection on what comedy is for you. What do you mm. think? Sure. Um, I could also tell you the, about the other Fast and Furious films. <laughs> can I just yeah, yeah, go yeah. through the rest of the list? Sure. So we had Too Fast, Too Furious, Calm Down, Sit Down. The title was written by their parents. Then you got Fast and Furious 3, which was called the Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift which is basically where they went so fast they couldn't stop and they ended up jumping over the Pacific Ocean. They ended up in Tokyo. How did that happen? They just drifted. They lost control and they ended up in Tokyo. Fast, the fourth one is called Just Fast and Furious. So by this point, the core values of the franchise have been established. It's just Fast and Furious. The fifth one is called Fast Five. Um, apparently, they forgot to be furious. They're just fast and there's five of them. It sounds like a kid's book. The Fast Five. Did it again. Yes, they solved the mystery. You know, the sixth one is called Fast and Furious 6. So, okay, they remembered to be furious again. Um, seventh is called Furious 7, which as far as I can tell is just some people standing there absolutely livid. But they're not fast, they're just furious now. Just, and there's seven of them just, uh, just standing there. What, uh, what's the matter? Why uh, We lost our driving licenses. Eighth one is called The Fate of the Furious. The Fate of the Furious. Um, high blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> you 
this is the fate of the furious. If you maintain that level of fury for that long, then, you know, well, your heart condition, well. watch out. Uh, the ninth one is called F9. Well. Uh, which is not as fast as F1. <laughs> no. Ch cheesy joke. That's a cheesy dad joke. Mm. Uh, number 10, the most recent one, was called Fast X Furious. It's a collaboration between Fast and Furious. <laughs> um, so that's it. Anyway, I needed to go through the rest of those titles. Yeah, are you going to use them? Are you going to... Yeah, I've, I've, used them a, I've used them a few times. Um, thing is, though, with that, because the, the Fast and Furious posters are no longer all over the city... Mm. and the film isn't really fresh in the cinemas anymore can't really uh, it's 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 less likely to strike a chord with people um because otherwise i'm just going to appear to be a, a madman who's obsessed with the fast, fast and, and furious, furious for no reason <laughs> you know like fa there's a new fast and furious movie out there isn't okay the, the 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 fast and furious 10 is out now on streaming services you know it's like less obvious oh, to the audience yeah. you know yeah, yeah. so I have used it a few times and it went well every time except for that one show when there were four people and they hated the franchise yeah. and, and so they just they weren't up for it. Um where can people find your material like your what? your clips um cuz I know that there's not a lot on your YouTube no, channel. No 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 so this is one of the things again about about this is that like so comedians um yeah we sort of should be sharing material it's normal mm. but because I haven't done that one man show, I'm kind of holding a lot, holding on to a lot of my material, and I'm reluctant to share too much of it because mm. once it's out there, then it can't can use it again. So there's still an ambition at the back of my mind, which mm. is that one day maybe I'll have a one man show and I'll film it and then I'll publish the whole lot and all my stuff will be out there as a as a as a, like a one hour show, which I might sell and then release or something. Um, but there's there's some clips of me doing stand up. It's mm -hmm. um, you know a few little bits and pieces on my YouTube channel. So if you just mm -hmm. go to Luke's English podcast on YouTube and then look at my playlists, um, then there's a playlist that's called comedy slash stand up. And there's one or two little clips of me doing stand up in there, including the the, the material about the BBC uh, news reporters. <laughs> yeah, they're talking a weird voice like they've yeah. been trained to do that. But okay, yeah. let's not spoil the joke, maybe. Okay. Because um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'll I'll link your YouTube channel to in the, in the show notes. Uh, I sure. wanted to recommend uh, a book, show your mm -hmm. work, because I've just yeah. finished this. Um, this could be a good way because this is for creative people. Ten ways to share your creativity and get discovered. So maybe you can find some good ideas there. Sounds good. By, show your work by yeah. Austin Cleon. Cleon, Cleon. Austin Klingon. Cleon, K L E O N. K L E O N. Okay. Cleon. Um Yeah, yeah. and right. there's there's one thing here about um it says the minute comedian George Carlin finished recording one of his HBO stand-up specials, he would throw out all these old jokes and start from scratch on a new hour of material for the next special. He did, uh, wait, an artist, this is what um, George Carlin says, an artist, an artist has an obligation to be en route, to be going somewhere, he said. Mm. There's, a journey, there's a journey involved. It keeps you trying to be fresh, trying to be new, trying to call on yourself a little more. Carlin learned that when you get rid of old material, you push yourself further and come up with something better. When you throw out old work, what you're really doing is making room for new work. Oh yeah, I've got to, I've got to take his advice, Fabio, because as I said before, you know, I'm holding on to tried and tested material, and I really need to get rid of it all. So I have huge respect for uh, comedians like Ricky Gervais and like my friend Paul Taylor, who will do a one-hour show. And do it and do it and do it until it's just gold, until it mm. smashes an audience every night. And then they film it and then they have to make the Done. painful decision of just to throw it all away and never do it again and move on 
and start again from scratch and build a whole 90 minute show from nothing uh, it must be so hard to let the material go but that's exactly what I will do eventually but I, and as I said I need to I feel like I need to film it and release it and then I can move on um, mm. uh, can I make a book recommendation as well yeah so um, always open to book recommendations up here on my shelf so this is my favorite book about stand-up comedy Steve Wait. Martin it's called Born Standing Up and it's a book by Steve Martin who is definitely one of my comedy heroes without a doubt okay. really interesting really interesting story so Steve Martin started really became famous as a stand-up comedian in the 70s and then in the early 80s and then he kind of just quit at the height of his career he quit doing stand-up and transitioned into making films and then later became a writer and he's kind of returned to comedy um, more recently um, with his comedy partner, Martin Short. You might have seen him on Conan's show, Conan O'Brien's show, and some other uh, late night TV shows and things. But uh, Mar Steve Martin well, and Martin Short are now a comedy double act. They've got a, a TV series with Selena Gomez called The Only Murders in the Building or something like that. Anyway, uh, but so for me, Steve Martin, yeah, a comedy legend. And this is his... Um, um, it's it's a story of his own um, career, and he describes how he spent ten years doing stand up and learning, ten years learning, five years refining, and then like five years in huge success, and then he quit um, when he was at the top of his game. And it's you know it's a really really well written um, story. Only for and only for comedians or no? I think anyone part? would find this oh, funny. Okay. Obviously, it's 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 about performance, about learning to be a performer. Mm. Uh, but it's also about how that intersects with your life and the way that you're, you know, um, it, it, he talks about his relationship with his father and his family life and how that maybe had a had a, a hand in in um, uh, pushing him towards comedy. You know, there's tragedy, there's sadness and tragedy in there too. Uh, really good, really touching. Um, Thank you. Book and and especially interesting that he's he's able to be serious and quite intellectual and quite you know he's got the he's got the skill of a writer, a very good writer in crafting a story. And then when you actually look at Steve Martin's uh, like famous uh, comedy movie, which is Steve Martin in concert, live in concert from I think 1980. The, the stuff he's doing is so silly, so ridiculously silly. And I mean, you can see the picture of him on the front. He's got like bunny rabbit yeah. ears on his head and he's doing a funny dance. Like his his routine was so, so uh, bizarre, strange and and silly. I just love that. I love that uh, sort of um, contrast. Um, and I love his comedy. So Steve Martin, Born Standing Up. That's my uh, book cool. recommendation. So we'll um, I'll put all these links in the show notes. I'll put the link to your YouTube channel, which I'm sure most of my listeners already know about. And um, thank you, Luke. Um, thank you, Fabio. I, I, Thanks. I hope this yeah I hope this conversation has I don't know you you found it interesting and introspective maybe to talk about things that maybe you don't normally talk about on your podcast. Yeah. Um and uh thanks thanks for giving I, me the opportunity to go on and on and on about stand up which um I don't do as often as as I would like people don't normally ask me about that thank you I would love yes. you to finish with and that's all my time people <laughs> <laughs> and that's all my time thank you Fabio for the show thanks everyone you've been fantastic I've been Luke Thompson good night <laughs> Well, what do you think of him? He's all right. <laughs>